Hello, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending which side of the country you, you are on this great morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our Advocacy Day welcome and keynote address. My name is Emily Taylor. I am the Director of Advocacy for Solve ME, uh, speaking here on behalf of our organization, the Solve ME CFS Initiative and our partners, the Long COVID Alliance. We have a very exciting event to bring to you today um, to kick off uh, ME CFS and Long COVID Advocacy Week, which is our fifth annual Advocacy Week event, which will be going on this entire week. So this is the first of many. If you have questions or would like more information about Advocacy Week, please visit us online at www.meadvocacyweek.com. Um, we have very special presentation today. Um, our opening comes from the ME Action Maryland State Chapter, um, our co-host of this event today. But before we get started, a quick note about our special presentation. As you notice, we are on the Zoom webinar platform to keep everyone safe and healthy in these times. Hopefully next year, we'll be back in Washington, D.C. in person. Um, we have uh, the audience and the, uh, is muted, and you can communicate through the uh, chat function which you'll see looks like a little think box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to share your comments and suggestions and thoughts in the chat box. Those will be recor uh, recorded for the future. This uh, panel is recorded. And so if you're not feeling well or need to leave early, uh, no problem. It'll be available on YouTube and social media after the event. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to get us started with a special welcome from the ME Action Maryland State Chapter. Hello, my name is Christine. Thank you, Representative Raskin, for being a champion for MECFS and keeping hope alive. Hi, I'm Rafi Shore. Thank you, Jamie, for helping my aunt. Hi, I'm Naomi Edelson. I live in Tacoma Park, and I want to say thank you to Jamie. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a champion for MECFS. Representative Raskin. Thank you so much for all your efforts in fighting for research for ME CFS patients in Maryland and in the United States. You are our hero. Thank you, Representative Raskin from Baltimore for sponsoring the first research legislation for CFS ME. Hello, I'm Whitney and I want to thank Representative Raskin for believing ME CFS patients and taking action by sponsoring the first ever ME CFS research legislation. Thank you, Representative Raskin, for raising awareness about MECFS. Thank you, Representative Raskin. Hi, I'm Amy, and I want to thank Representative Raskin for supporting the MECFS community year after year and for sponsoring the first ever MECFS research legislation. Thank you for your efforts. Hello, my name is Lauren Bean, and I'm a constituent of Representative Jamie Raskin from Bethesda, Maryland. I'm pre-recording this because on April 19th, I will be unable to be live as I will be receiving an immune treatment. Over the last three years, I have been among the patients and allies who have met with Rep Raskin and his staff on Advocacy Day. Back when we were able to meet in the same room, he took the time to be there personally. I was a bit nervous, of course, and have to say that I am so grateful for the way Representative Raskin received us with compassion, curiosity, and a desire to be helpful. I remember feeling especially touched when, during one of these meetings, I mentioned that increased funding was needed for treatments so that we patients could have a better quality of life. And he responded with something like, well, how about a cure? I'm not sure why that surprised me so much, but it did. Perhaps because I felt heard. And the value of that is hard to put into words, but few patients and allies have had a similar validation from a person in power. But of course, Rep Raskin did not give us mere words. He introduced the first bill specifically for MECFS. Personally, it has been gratifying to see my own congressman take the lead 
and it has given me new hope for treatments and maybe a cure. So I just want to say a heartfelt thank you to Congressman Jamie Raskin for his leadership and his commitment to MECFS. And I am so pleased to introduce him today. So welcome to the kickoff for the fifth annual MECFS Advocacy Week. My name is Melinda and I am a fourth time Solve MECFS Advocacy Day advocate, co-founder and chapter co-chair of ME Action Maryland, as well as a Maryland constituent. As a decade long person with MECFS, I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker. Like many of you who are newly joining us this year, my MECFS onset was post viral. In 2009, I had H1N1, the swine flu, a mild case, but one I didn't quite recover from. The lack of clinicians knowledge, medical gaslighting, and the stigma of post-infectious illnesses not only made me progress from mild to severe illness, it also gave me no choice but to speak out and advocate for myself and others. I was inspired to start ME Action Maryland chapter with Whitney Fox after participating in previous congressional advocacy, seeing other Maryland advocates at days like this, joining grassroots campaigns with ME Action, and ultimately by seeing Representative Raskin's introduction of HR 7057 the first ever bill for MECFS and neuroimmune illnesses. We wanted to expand the congressional advocacy to our state level with outreach and by building our local community. Our goals are increased recognition for MECFS as this illness should be as easily known and recognized as all other prevalent illnesses and diseases to advocate for local funding, increased research, and the needed clinical care for the tens of thousands of Marylanders affected by MECFS. Having a champion for our illness at the national level from our state has made us not only feel seen, it also gives us the hope we can affect change to overcome the barriers MECFS has faced for decades. As you heard from Lauren, Representative Raskin not only wants treatments for MECFS, he wants to see a cure. Representative Raskin and his office work hard to make us heard and to help all of his constituents. With Congressman Raskin today is Rona Kramer. I wanted to also say a personal thank you to Rona. Rona was the first person I met going into my first Solve ME advocacy meeting on the Hill a few years ago. Rona helped me feel comfortable and ensured my story was heard even when my brain fog made it difficult. So thank you, Rona, not only for your kind help but also for using your voice for MECFS. With that, please allow me to introduce a champion in the house for all affected by MECFS and the wide range of post-viral chronic illnesses serving Maryland's eighth district, Representative Jamie Raskin. M Melinda, hey, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Lauren Bean, for your beautiful words. I wanna thank all of my friends out there for uh, all of your kindness. Uh, and uh, I was first introduced to uh, MECFS, actually by Rona Kramer, uh, who I served with in the Maryland State Senate, uh, who told me about uh, the situation of her daughter, and I'll let her elaborate the details. But I was uh, so shocked and moved by what she had to tell me that this was something I began to pay attention to. And then when I had a, a delegation that came to visit me, and people went around and described their personal stories and their experience um, battling all of their symptoms. I knew this was something that uh, we needed to work on and we needed a lot more research and analysis uh, than we had. And so that was the genesis of HR 7057 that I introduced. I am the Congressman from uh, NIH and I know um, the, the amount of resources that we put into NIH and I also know what they can do and how much mileage we can get out of uh, an investment there in terms of understanding particular uh, diseases and then arriving at treatment and cure of those diseases. I remember when I first got elected to the House of Representatives back in 2016, I took over in 17 and um, a former president had uh, suggested slashing the NIH budget by $5 billion. That was the very first thing that I worked on when I when I got here and um, 
I got to meet all of the different constituencies that mobilize for research funding, cystic fibrosis and multiple sclerosis and um, sickle cell anemia and lung cancer and heart disease and so on. And I realized that there's real power in these medical constituencies coming together. And I made my first speech on the house floor about this. I got up and I said, I don't understand the logic of slashing the scientific and medical research budget into the, all of the killer diseases that are undermining our people and weakening our population. And I mentioned you know, all of them, the cystic fibrosis and multiple sclerosis and kidney disease and lung cancer. I, I think I even mentioned um, uh, malignant narcissistic personality disorder, uh, which uh, you know it has a federal budget allotted uh, to it. But um, this is how you get on the map, doing exactly what you guys are doing today. You organize together and you say, my situation uh, as painful and as solitary as it may feel sometimes is actually not just a personal thing. It's a social, it's a social problem, it's a social issue out there, lots of people, lots of families, lots of communities are wrestling with it. And then there's power in that recognition of the solidarity that exists within uh, the community. And that power can be galvanized and channeled towards demanding research um, through an allocation of public resources, a recognition that this is something that's affecting our people and we all need to arrive at an answer together. And I don't need to tell you that um, the, the constituency for pushing for research and understanding and progress on uh, MECFS has only grown with COVID-19 uh, and the so-called long haulers because there is a substantial percentage of the people who've been stricken with COVID-19 who wrestle with the uh, disease long after um, you know, the most acute or severe symptoms are gone, but continue to experience, you know, the, the brain fog and the mental exhaustion and the muscular weakness and so on. So we've got to get on top of this. I salute all of you for the organizing. I appreciate this recognition. I don't know if it's deserved, uh, but I will work to deserve it by continuing to stay on the case and working with all of you. And with that, I guess we turn it over to Rona or maybe someone will tell me what to do here. I'd be happy to jump in here. Um, first of all, I have to tell everyone that I have been looking forward very, very much to having uh, the opportunity to share this morning with Jamie Raskin. Uh, he is... Um, absolutely a wonderful human being. We served together in the Maryland Senate, as you noted, Jamie, and um, it um, and and there has always been a great deal of respect. He is the best champion that we could possibly have. Um, not only brilliant, but just a sweetheart. So uh, very, very happy to be here with you. What we would really like to discuss, um, Representative, is the very best way that we can influence Capitol Hill with our issues. Uh, it is, uh, you're, you hear from hundreds of people a week, at least, about their issues. I can tell you personally that there isn't an issue out there that doesn't have advocates and many of them, and that there is no way that we can fund everything and support everything. So what is it about MECFS or the, the advocacy that we brought to you uh, that influenced you to become our champion, you've been our hero. And I know that you have also been um, uh, involved in, and heard from many, many other advocacy groups. Can you tell us what it is that really influences you most heavily when you have an advocate come in to speak with you? We have 65% of the people who are advocating this year for MECFS COVID long haul um, who are um, uh, new to this, who've never done this before. 
Could you give us your thoughts on that? Yes, um, and Rona, I should tell you, I've been looking forward to seeing you so much over the last week or so as this been, has been on my schedule. So I, I, I miss my old friends in Annapolis and thank you for your kind words. But look, I, I go back to our original conversation um, and then conversations like that. I mean, what moves me is the specificity and the singularity of people's stories. Um, that alone is not gonna be enough because you have to channel a busy member of Congress or state legislature, state legislature, whatever it is, um, into a specific action. And so, um, you know, we want a very specific ask uh, related to, um, you know, I suppose, you know, our organizers will tell us exactly what you want to end up with. But I would say, give them the humanity of the situation, tell them what you're wrestling with, and explain that there are not good answers out there right now. There are not agreed upon medical regimens and protocols to deal with. We're still very much in just the infancy of understanding this disease. And that's where the investment in NIH becomes such a powerful tool for advancing our understanding and our ability to wrestle with it. So uh, please don't be shy about telling your story. But you know, on the other hand, um, you don't want to tell them about your entire life necessarily. Uh, so you've got to balance it with giving other people time to have the floor too. So, you know, I, um, the, you know, this is probably um, absurdly obvious, but I would take some time to practice telling within a minute or two exactly what, you know, you've been dealing with and give people the kinds of details that will strike them and then say, and so we're asking for just a very simple thing, your support on, you know, whatever the agreed upon uh, legislative package is for this Congress. Yeah, thank you. That's great. And I have to, it was noted by Lauren Bean, I believe, in the opening. And I loved that opening video production, by the way. But uh, she noted that you met with us personally. And that's very rare. Most of us will be meeting as we're doing our visits. Uh, we'll be meeting with staff. And it was wonderful that you chose to be there personally with us. Um, I agree completely. And I have... Um, found that the advocates that have been most impressive are the ones who do tell a personal story. And I can remember when I was serving on the Health and Human Services Subcommittee of Budget and Taxation in the Senate, um, we heard uh, hundreds of advocates a week would come in and talk about funding their budget. And there was a gentleman, a young man who was about 20 years old, who came in uh, to testify about a budget for um, uh, funding for support and for those with disabilities. And he was severely disabled, had very, very little muscle control, was in a wheelchair, could not even speak had to have someone assisting him with everything. And he had a, a dowel attached to his head with which he would type his speak his speech or, uh, into a voice synthesizer. And he, his testimony on this particular day, and he had testified previously, but on this day, he said, I wanna tell you what a few hours or a day in my life is like. He said, I'm 20 years old. My mother is, is uh, a lot older. She's in her 50s. She likes to go to bed at eight o'clock at night. She's my caregiver. When she wants to go to bed, I have to go to bed. So she puts me into my bed at 7.30 at night. I'm a 20 year old. I'm lying in bed with nothing to do but stare at the ceiling at 7.30 at night for hours until I fall asleep. I can't tell you what anyone else said that day. Can't tell you what else he said, but wow, that really struck home for me because at 20 years old, 
I was out partying. I was socializing probably more than studying, which I should have been doing. But every other 20 year old is ha has a very different life. And that was so inequitable that I certainly remembered that with every funding decision that I had made then and from that day on and, and still to this day, I can remember that. So uh, to me, that is the most influential testimony that I could have heard. And I can tell you that I got involved in public service because I was always told you've got no right to complain if you don't get involved. My parents always taught me that. I can also tell you that one person can make a difference. One person can absolutely make a difference and change the world in some way. And I think everyone going into this needs to, uh, to keep that in mind. And that's how we move forward and how we change the world. Um, tell us if you would, we know that uh, personal stories are uh, important. How, do, how would you respond, Representative Raskin, to people who uh, maybe a little bit shy about telling a personal story, something rather than uh, keeping it on a uh, uh, an impersonal level. How yeah, would yeah. you make? How, what would you tell them about sharing something personal? Well, they, I think that's a great question, Rona, because it it underscores the importance of coordinating the conversation in advance. And I know that uh, it's become a little difficult. Uh, with COVID-19, but at the very least, you know, you can do um, a pre-Zoom Zoom if you're going to meet or a pre-Zoom meeting if you're going to meet in person. But, you know, the brainstorm, maybe some, you know, maybe some people want to tell their personal story and are uninhibited, you know, or less inhibited about it. Others may want to describe the legislation quickly and the importance of it and say a word about why it's so important to them. Not everybody needs to do exactly the same thing. Um, and, uh, but you, you know, you do, as you're suggesting with that powerful story, you do want at least a, a few of the people there to be able to tell stories that will uh, hit people in the gut, you know, that will um, stick with them. Um, because as you're saying that there are, you know, lots of competing medical causes out there. Um, and um, in some sense, you know, MECF, CFS, we're still trying to get on the map. And so you want, you, you want to break that sound barrier. If you're not able to speak to the member, definitely, you know, see if you can speak to their senior health policy legislative assistant, get that person, you know, see if you can form a connection there. Um, but uh, you know, I, I live, uh, you know, my district is on the border of Washington, D.C. So we have a lot of people who know government, a lot of people who know politics, a lot of people work on Capitol Hill and so on. Uh, Rona, you know it well. Um, but um, what those people do is they will use every avenue of access to a member that they want to talk to um, that is available to them, whether it's a connection through the kid's school, it's a seeing them at the supermarket, um, you know, you know, the person's press secretary, whatever it might be, you know, establish that personal contact. So it becomes real in the mind of the member. And the other thing, of course, is writing, you know, is uh, emailing or writing up, you know, if somebody's super duper shy, uh, or they're nervous about talking about it in public, um, they could they could write, uh, you know, a page long description or two pages, um, you know, give you the opportunity to focus on the, the important details, have somebody, you know, help you revise it, edit it, whatever it might be. Um, I mean, I, I can't guarantee you that they'll read it, but um, there are insomniac members of Congress like me who read everything that comes in, uh, but somebody might read it. And so you never know what's going to work. No, no good act is ever wasted in this field. Excellent, that's, that's just terrific, thank you. I really 
agree and like your suggestion that people continue the advocacy beyond advocacy day and uh, and that having the personal contact throughout the year is a very good idea and uh, letting representatives know that uh, you're available to them uh, to answer questions uh, and to be a sounding board uh, and always there throughout the year is a very good point. Thank you. Um, I don't know uh, whether we have any time left or we're ready to move on to other speakers. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being mindful of the time, Rona. We are uh, at time, and I know the congressman has uh, probably 100 more meetings today. So we wanted to thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us, and um, and we are so grateful. We look forward to meeting with you, Representative Raskin, tomorrow as part of Advocacy Day. And um, Re Representative uh, or Secretary Kramer, uh, thank you again for being part of Advocacy Day and leading many groups from uh, the great state of Maryland. Uh, thank you both for your time, and um, we hope to see you again soon. Pleasure is Secretary Kramer, sending you love, sending love to all my friends out there. Thank you. And uh, Ovid Amate, the CEO of Solve ME CFS Initiative, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Resking and Secretary Kramer for your long-term dedication uh, and obviously for your time today. Uh, you both faced incredible challenges in the years since uh, the previous advocacy day. So we're grateful for your support. Um, and really very special thanks to nearly 1000 advocates for participating in Advocacy Day tomorrow. I'm, I'm just humbled by this amazing, amazing community effort. Um, and now it's my pleasure and an honor to introduce to you uh, the speakers um, of the next panel. Um, Representative Reskin just told us that specific and singular stories are really what can make an impact on people on the Hill. Um, so today we have two remarkable people uh, with us uh, to share their singular uh, and very compelling perspectives. Um, Ashanti Daniel is a registered nurse and former fitness enthusiast who uh, received her MECFS diagnosis on ME Awareness Day, May 12th, four years, uh, four years ago in 20, uh, 2017. Ashanti is now disabled because of this disease. She's a single mother living in Southern California. Uh, she's a veteran advocate including presenting on last year's Congressional Bipartisan Women's Caucus briefing, which was titled Women's Chronic Illness During a Pandemic. You may also recognize Ashanti from her recent appearance in Times Magazine's uh, excellent piece, which uh, I was published just last week uh, with the title, Black Women Are Fighting to Be Recognized as Long COVID Patients. Or you all may, may also recognize her as the face of uh, ME Action's Stop, Rest, Pace, campaign. Thank you, Ashanti, for joining us today. And we'd like to also uh, welcome Sarah Tompkins, who joins us uh, from our partners at the Rare Disease Legislative Advocates, where she serves on the Community Congress, representing herself and other patients with uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and other hypermobility spectrum disorders. I hope uh, you'll all join me in congratulating Sarah on her recent crown as uh, Ms. Wheelchair Pacific Coast USA for 2021. We look forward to see you uh, compete in July at the National uh, Pageant for uh, Ms. Wheelchair USA. Good luck. Um, so a warm welcome to both of you and really thank you for joining us today to share your advocacy experiences. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'll start out with a little bit of an intro Ashanti, would you like to speak first? Um, sure, that's fine. I'll go ahead and go. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Oh, of course. Good morning or afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. As Ovid stated, I am Ashanti Daniel, a disabled registered nurse and single mother. I am extremely excited to be a part of the kickoff event for Advocacy Week. I would like to share a little of my story, including how I found myself in the world of advocacy. Like many of the COVID long haulers, following a viral illness in August 2016, I became ill with myalgic encephalomyelitis, ME, 
or ME-CFS, formerly known as chronic fatigue syndrome. At the time I became Ill, Ill, I was truly living my best life. I was working out five, sometimes six days a week, doing high intensity interval training. In fact, I was so fit, I looked like a trainer and was frequently asked if I was one. I was the picture of health. I was also a very active single mother to my then 11 year old son and my young adult daughter who had just begun her second year at Penn State University. Go Nittany Lions. I was working night shift as a nurse, um, excuse me, as a neonatal intensive care unit, NICU and congenital cardiac ICU nurse. Whoa, that's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> okay, seriously. I just want to clearly paint the picture of how healthy I was before ME came along, like an invisible thief in the night and stole the life I once had the plans I made, the career I love with my whole heart and soul. One of the hardest parts of this devastating disease is that it has forced me to miss countless moments with my children that I will never get back. Thanks to ME, I suddenly went from being a mom who never missed a baseball game to being a mom who rarely ever made it to a game, leaving my son without any family to cheer him on as he played the sport he loves. I don't get do-overs for all the baseball games my son played in and home runs he hit that I missed because I was trapped in my bed or in the hospital, too sick many days to even lift my head unassisted, let alone my body. Nursing, my beloved career, and life's purpose gone in the blink of an eye. The ability to shower standing up daily was no more. Anyone who knew me before I became ill knows I love showers. Well, I went from showering one to two times a day pre-illness to being lucky if I could shower one to two times per week and I had to shower sitting down. I still have to shower sitting down. And when I do, my heart races in the 140s and 150s. For context, normal adult heart rate at rest, showering is considered rest, is 60 to 100 beats per minute. On that same note, I want to mention ME typically brings, quote, friends, also known as comorbidities. One of my comorbidities is a rare form of dysautonomia called autoimmune autonomic neuropathy. And along with many other issues, it is responsible for my high heart rate while showering. Imagine going from being a person who was so physically fit prior to this illness that I was often mistaken for a trainer to being bedridden 90 to 95% of the time and needing a wheelchair or motorized scooter. Hard to imagine, right? Now, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about how I found myself smack dab in the middle of advocacy. Following multiple lengthy hospitalizations, an infectious disease doctor that did not believe me and nine months of suffering with this, at that time, mystery illness, I was officially diagnosed with ME on International ME Awareness Day. I don't know who believes in, quote, signs, but to me, there could not have been a clearer sign that I was going to be thrust into the world of advocacy, whether I liked it or not. Unbeknownst to me at the time, advocacy would give me a much needed, renewed sense of purpose after my previous one, nursing, was stolen by MP. Advocacy is not easy, and it's often frustrating more times than not, but hey, I like to grab challenges by the horns. So I participate in as much advocacy as my illness will allow. This is really important to remember when thinking about advocates with ME and or long COVID. This illness makes it impossible for many of its warriors to advocate to be advocates, which is why it is critical for our community, including the COVID long haulers, to have advocates that are healthy allies, caregivers and or loved ones of ME and COVID long hauler warriors. I cannot stress how important advocacy is in and of itself. However, advocacy in which people of color and other marginalized groups are represented is critical. Historically, the media has portrayed this as a white woman's disease, but it is so much broader than that. I urge any people of color who are watching this right now to join us. We want and need you. Visibility matters so much. There is no better time than the present. After all, it is Advocacy Week. So welcome, thank you for being here. And to those of you who are ME and or 
COVID long hauler warriors, I am so sorry. You are now a part of this, albeit wonderful and supportive, chronic illness community. After all, nobody wants to be chronically ill. For those of you that are able, I hope you are ready to get to work. Hard to follow up on such a eloquent speech, Ashanti. You are such an incredible advocate, not only in your actions, but in every word you choose. So I'm so Thank grateful you, to be a part of this with you. Thank you, likewise. You Oh, thanks. So to introduce myself, I'm Sarah B. Tompkins. I live in Bellevue, Washington, and I'm an Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and Hypermobility Spectrum Disorder and Rare Disease Patient Advocate. That is a mouthful. Um, but as many advocates are going to learn, you, you wear different hats, whether it's invisible illness, whether it's advocating for a loved one or family member or yourself or for disability or for getting the right medical care. We often wear many hats in order to make that happen. And my advocacy journey really began uh, with my symptom onset in high school at Seattle Children's Hospital. And it wasn't until 2011 that I was able to see a geneticist for my official Ehlers-Danlos diagnosis. Once that diagnosis was in my medical record, it opened so many doors for tests and appointments and specialists that I really needed to see, but I really had to advocate in order to even get to that point. Um, and once I had that official diagnosis, just a few days later, I attended my very first support group, medical support group at University of Washington for Ehlers-Danlos and Hypermobile Patients. This is where I met my best late friend, Kelly Seltzer-Doyle. She was probably the best advocate I'd met up until that point. She did not take no for an answer, and she was very firm on putting patients first. It was on her journey to the NIH in 2014 that on, she passed away unexpectedly uh, at her home in Kansas. And it was in great deal because of the lack of awareness and knowledge about Ehlers-Danlos and hypermobility as is similar with ME and CFS. And that's why it's so important for patients and caregiver and family advocates to also participate. Um, Particularly when patients aren't feeling well, we need that extra advocacy from the community, be it your tight, tighter community of family friends or be it the local community of your area. Uh, that can make all the difference. And it was after her passing that I really knew I wanted to do something for advocacy. So in 2015, I had the luck of going with a group of other patients down to Olympia, our Washington state capital, where we were able to establish Rare Disease Day, a 2015, February 28th. And uh, it was a huge moment of success, not only for my own patient community, but for all rare patient communities. And it's that kind of advocacy that there is so much crossover in many different diseases. And that's why it's so great to be an advocate because you really truly do learn no matter what stage of advocacy you're at, uh, meeting other advocates, you always pick up more and you always learn more. And even though it's year five into advocacy, I find myself learning new things every day, which is only, only more positive to help not only make my advocacy as effective as possible, um, but to help as many people as possible all in that same advocacy. Um, so under that light, I wanted to ask Ashanti, uh, what does this successful advocacy look like to you? Well, <laughs> I would say um, successful advocacy does not look like success in the traditional sense. Um, just for some statistics, the average rate for bill passage in Congress is four to 5%. Um, and so I'd like to say, like baseball, advocacy is a game of failure. If you have a batting average of 300 in baseball, that is considered excellent. What that means for people who don't know the game of baseball is for every 10 times you're up to bat, you will only be successful three times. So that means you will only successfully get a hit 
30% of the time. In almost every other aspect of life, 30% is failing miserably, <laughs> but not in baseball. And most importantly, not in advocacy. If you succeed in advocacy 30% of the time, you are literally knocking it out of the park. So I would like to encourage, you know, this is not part of the question, but I just wanna add this on, anyone who becomes an advocate to stay the course. It does require a lot of patience. It does require a lot of trial and error. It does require a lot of um, falling and getting back up. So anyway, that's what successful advocacy looks like to me. Well said, very exactly the points I would have uh, touched on myself. Uh, an example of, like Ashanti said, it's not necessarily typical or what you would expect standard success to be, uh, but meeting with my House Representative Congressman Adam Smith, uh, he right off the bat said, you know, I, I'm a military intelligence person. I'm really not a health person. I don't have a great understanding of all of that. Um, but in talking, we found out we had the same hip surgeon. And so I was able to say, oh, that hip surgery is what I have to have more frequently than you at a younger age. But it really gave him enough of an understanding so he could support me. And he ended up joining the Rare Disease Caucus with RDLA very soon after. So even though he said, no, I don't know, don't count on me by the end of the conversation, we had so many things in common that he's been a great resource and not just for signing up to the Rare Disease Caucus, but for any kind of questions I might have or projects that might be going on, I can always contact him. And that's the gift about advocating when you don't know an answer. It's just a really great way to follow up afterwards and say, hey, I asked this person and they had this answer. And especially for new advocates, uh, Try not to answer anything you don't know. Use that as an opportunity to get in touch with the people that do know. And then that really creates the relationship between the advocate and your politicians so that they're more aware of you in the future and they think of you when other legislation or policies come up. And uh, absolutely, leaving yes. your mark is really important and building a relationship as well. Exactly. It, it, it means the world of difference, having them know your name or think of you when these kind of things come up. And so my second question is, uh, what barriers existed along your patient advocacy journey? And could you share how you overcame these barriers or barrier in your advocacy? Hmm, let me see. Um, I would say my barriers to um, my patient advocacy journey would be health, of course, because I am a person with ME. And as I mentioned briefly in um, my speech, it's really hard for most of us. And there have been times where I haven't been able to participate in advocacy because I've been too sick. And really, in all honesty, a hallmark symptom of this disease is something called post-exertional malaise or PEM. And what that is, is a worsening of symptoms following mental or physical exertion. And I want to be clear, it's not exertion in the sense that healthy people think of, it's exertion in terms of, for example, taking a shower. That can sometimes um, land people in bed for days, weeks, even months. Um, cooking a meal, same thing, can have the same effect. So there's always payback for everything that we do. So we all have to be very calculated in what we agree to participate in. And sometimes you think like, oh, hey, I can do that, I'll be fine. And then afterward, your body lets you know, uh, no, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> so I think that that's, you know. <laughs> so true, you know, right. you think at the time, oh, going great. But then, and especially when you're excited in the moment or it's a big moment of advocacy, sometimes you don't realize how tired you are or the, cost you end up paying with physically later until yes. after the event. And that can make it really hard to decipher what is injury prone or going to make your symptoms exacerbated and what's not. Um, but tacking on to your answer, I would also say um, being able to pre-record, work ahead, do as much of that as you can, knowing that your health symptoms might fluctuate day to day. Um, but otherwise, the community of patient advocates are incredible. They're very understanding about us having health issues that are out of our control. 
Um, and the great thing about virtual and having email and having these kind of forums is that we are able to ease, easily or get in contact with the people we want to advocate with and other patient advocates. So it's really been a tool that I hope continues so that we really get that accessibility for all patient advocates, some that aren't able to leave their home perhaps. Right, and that actually, so you answered the question for me. <laughs> um, that is actually how I have overcome that specific barrier in terms of my health, obviously being able to be right here in my living room <laughs> has helped a lot. Um, but another barrier I would say is representation because there are not many black advocates and that is something that I have yet to overcome. I hope though, I'm very hopeful that with this new advocacy week, that there will be more um, Black advocates joining our efforts because that's really important. As I stated in my speech, representation, visibility really matters. So thank you for that, Sarah. And I actually have a question for you. It's your turn. Of course. <laughs> you get to be in the hot seat. <laughs> no, not, it's not really a hot seat. But you make you know. it easy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so you mentioned your best friend in your speech and how she essentially inspired you to become an advocate. Can you elaborate on that and share a little bit more about what it was about her that um, inspired you? I would love to. Uh, Kelly had such an amazing energy about her. Not only did she not take no for an answer when she truly needed a surgery or a specialist or a certain appointment, um, but she would say, if they're not listening to you, find someone else. And I was a little bit shy at the beginning of my diagnosis where that was very difficult for me to speak up and say, oh, I don't, I don't know if that's right. And she had such a great uh, MO for putting herself forward as a patient, knowing that doctors won't make those referrals or sometimes the specialists that you need to see your tests or exams you need done for diagnoses. Um, and her, uh, passion to always stand up for not only herself, but all of her EDS hypermobile and any chronic illness friend, um, be them friend or stranger. She was always very, very open to helping others. And along with that, um, because she was so invested in NIH research, it's really, really been empowering for me to continue that work and try to advocate through those same venues. And uh, I'm actually a part of the head study for the EDS Society looking for the cause. So I feel like Yay. Kelly's certainly <laughs> guiding me that way, uh, making up for her study. But, you know, when I show up to meetings with my uh, congressmen and women in different uh senators uh, meetings or their staff, um, you know, I always say, yes, it's great that I can be here one of one of 800 or 1000 that might have this disease. And I'm very blessed because of my medical care and surgeries I've been able to get. But how much more powerful would it be if all 800 of us could show up? Although that's not possible physically for everyone. That's, that's the kind of movement that we need to show that it's not just one person. They're usually reflective of a whole group of patient community. And I, I encourage everyone, it's, it's not just one person that needs that role. It's everyone can take the role of an advocate. And that only furthers our cause, um, brings a lot of credibility to what we're trying to say, as well as hopefully pushes the needle forward in getting different legislation and policies together that'll help this patient community, but all patient communities that are chronic illness or invisible illness, where we really have to uh, have confidence in our diagnosis. Uh, even last week, I met a medical uh, staffer who said, you don't look sick and you don't look disabled. And I said, I, I explained mm -hmm. my loose joints and EDS and everything and the fatigue with that. But it, even years after it still happens and I still get a little emotional thinking someone might not believe me. Um, and so that's been an even more healing and self-confidence growing thing to be able to be a patient advocate because it does give me confidence speaking about my medical situations in a way where if somebody says, but you don't look sick or you don't look disabled right, that's the most and i have that phrase i think i hear <laughs> oh i'm sure i think we all probably do 
Absolutely. Very frustrating. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. So oh, I'd like to know what advice you have for first time advocates. Of course. Yes. I actually, this is my badge for my very first, it has my maiden name on it. How cute. Um, <laughs> 2000 and I think it was 15 or 16, my very first lobby day legislative West Coast conference through RDLA. And gosh, when I went there, I felt so uh, naive to all of the policies and legislations and different actions you can take. And I think that's been one of the biggest things that, that new advocates need to learn is even if there isn't a specific legislation to your disease, it doesn't mean that there aren't pieces of legislation and policy that aren't going to be hugely helpful for your patient community. Um, and that's sometimes not always that apparent uh, when it says NIH funding or appropriations for something, right. but that really does trick. It's silly to say, but it does trickle down to many different diseases. And so many diseases have affiliations and overlap and symptoms where I really do think studying them all at once is going to be the most beneficial to coming up with cures and treatments. And for our new patients, you are the expert of what you've gone through. So if if you feel nervous or uncomfortable sharing your story, just remember, you know this story better than anyone. Uh, it doesn't take prepared note cards all the time. Sometimes just speaking from the heart about your experience is the most genuine, authentic, and effective that you can be as a patient advocate. As, and although it's hard at first, I, I encourage you, if you have nurses, doctors, family members, practice on them. They make, uh, granted, you should ask permission, but they make really great practice people because they can say, oh, what's that? Or if they don't know that term, you can come up with a layman term to sort of explain it to them in a way that's more um, comprehensible. So that's, it's, it's important to practice, definitely, and not give up because certainly I, even though I've been advocating for five years, I still learn things to this day that make me a better advocate. So that's one of the brilliant things is that I really don't think uh, participating and learning more webinars, you're only going to improve. Right. And yes, we are definitely experts of our own bodies. Everyone should remember that you know your body better than anyone else. So. Exactly. This was awesome, Sarah. Thank you. I think that's all the time that we have yes, um, for you. questions, but this was a pleasure and you've been awesome. Oh, likewise. It's, you know, it's so funny how much overlap we have with these often invisible or chronic illnesses. So it's so great to meet patients from different patient communities because it really makes you realize we have so many of the same needs and that we okay. just need to, we're stronger together. As yes, we are all in this together for sure. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you thank so you much. Both. Thank you both so much for your time, Sarah and Ashanti. It's been truly a pleasure working with you. And we're so glad for you to share your, your stories and your insights and experience with us as the special welcome and kickoff event for the fifth annual and largest ever MECFS Advocacy Day um, we've ever had. We have nearly a thousand advocates registered, uh, many of whom are joining us on this uh, kickoff event today. So thank you all so much. Uh, just a quick reminder about all the amazing events we have coming up this week. Tomorrow, for those thousand advocates I just mentioned, tomorrow is your Advocacy Day remote congressional meetings. Do log in and check your schedule. That link is in your email box. If you haven't already, definitely check. That'll come from Saul CFS at Constituent Services. Um, so take a look for those email addresses. If you haven't seen it, please, for more information, go to www.meadvocacyweek.com. All of the information about Advocacy Week is there. But if you haven't registered and are not one of those thousand folks taking congressional meetings, you can still participate. Don't forget, we have Wednesday Social Media Day, and you can take all of the actions online at the Action Kit. The, uh, it's it just put in actionkit21.com. Note there's no www on this one. So it's just actionkit21.com. Immediately into your address bar, you'll get to this great website with all of the actions you can take. 
You can call your members of Congress, post the social media. Um, we also have a very special event, um, TBA, TB announced um, on, on Wednesday, uh, the 21st for a, a, a congressional announcement coming um, coming on that day that you can also promote on social media. Don't forget also our uh, third annual Empower ME Roundtable. This year, we're talking about elevating your voice in research about how advocacy can be used in the research space. And for those of you who have extra questions or want to speak one-on-one -on -one with our panelists from the Empower ME event on Thursday, April 22nd, we have office hours on Friday, April 23rd to create that special opportunity for you to talk one-on-one -on -one with some of our experts. So again, a really exciting MECFS Advocacy Week planned for you. Um, please check it out. Again, the uh, all the information is at www.meadvocacyweek.com, or if you just want to go straight to taking action, it's actionkit21.com. Thank you all again for joining us in this very special kickoff event for an exciting and amazing fifth annual Advocacy Week. We look forward to having you at many events in the future, and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. Rest up. We'll see you bright and early tomorrow for your congressional meetings. Ashanti and Sarah, thank you again for sharing your experiences. Um, I'm hoping to see you tomorrow as well, <laughs> and uh, have thank a wonderful you. rest of your day. Oh, thank you, and thank you all for this incredible event.